Welcome as we heed the Lord's call to remember the Sabbath day and make it holy. Let us join our hearts and voices together as we sing our opening hymn, Send, O Lord, Your Holy Spirit. Greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you to the Sunday, September 15th, 2024, worship service at Zion Lutheran Church, Lincoln, Illinois. Participating in this morning's broadcast are Dennis Knauer, Linda McEwen, and Brian Featon. Our organist is Dora Thompson, and our opening hymn is number 681, Send, O Lord, Your Holy Spirit. Hymn number 681, found in the Lutheran service book. Debbie Taylor, Logan, and Madison Taylor and their families are sponsoring the flowers on the altar today to the glory of God in loving memory of Eric Thomas Taylor. The Burwell family is sponsoring the radio broadcast today to the glory of God in loving memory of Jean Burwell. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty Almighty God, God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. 
I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our support and defense in every need, continue to preserve your church in safety, govern her by your goodness, and bless her with your peace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. The Old Testament reading for this, the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, the 50th chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall be put, not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The catechetical review. In regards to the Ten Commandments, what does God say about all these commandments? He, he says, says, I, the Lord, Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep those commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. The epistle reading from James, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, They are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the Alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can... All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. 
And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Having heard the words of Christ, we confess our Christian faith through the Nicene Creed. I believe believe in in one God, God, the the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of of heaven heaven and earth, and and of all things things visible visible and invisible, and in in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only only begotten begotten Son of God, God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, God, light of light, light, very God God of very God, God, begotten, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the singing of the hymn. The hymn of the day is hymn number 695, Not for Tongues of Heaven's Angels. Hymn number 695, found in the Lutheran Service Book. The sermon text taken from today's epistle reading, the book of James, the third chapter, the first verse. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater 
straightness. The words of our text. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. I read that and I thought, oh, this is going to be a good one. This is going to be a good one. My mind reeled with the possibilities. It is a presidential election season, yes. And we still have the internet, don't we? My memory, and I'll tell you what, what kind of one of the things, this is a connect the dots thing. My mind went back to a couple books I read. It was either uh, on combat or on, on killing uh, by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, and, and he was studying uh, the effects of, of uh, taking life uh, by bomber crews, by artillerymen, and by infantrymen. And the study was showing that the farther away somebody is from the mayhem that they create, the less mental problem they have with it, right? So when you see somebody face to face and you do things to them, it's a lot harder on you than being it away from a distance. I thought, yeah, just like the internet, isn't it, right? You and you're, when you're sitting there ripping on somebody on your Facebook page, uh, that's easy to do because you don't see them turn red. You don't see their eyes. You don't see them cry. You don't see any of those things. So it's easy to do it. It's much harder to do it face to face with somebody else, isn't it? And, you know, it gets easier to dehumanize somebody and it gets easier and easier to put them down and get on their case. Although it's not the tongue that's doing it. It's the fingers that are doing it. And, of course, the heart is right there uh, pushing it all. The heart is, right, the source of both things, the tongue and the fingers is, is the heart. And then I thought, and, you know, I'm still pondering this text, and I was thinking about all the damage I've done with my tongue. Some of it is on purpose, regrettably so, Sometimes it's just being foolish and silly. I mean, bel bel no, believe me, working with junior high students is a mindset changer. I'm going to tell you that. I've said more damaging things trying to be fun and relational and silly pastor uh, than anything else. And just so you know, preteens, they're mean. And they can really dish it out, but they can't take it. And it's taken me years to learn how to guard my lips, and quite frankly, I still stick my foot in it sometimes. It's just that they, they look so much mature than they actually are, um, and than they are emotionally. And sometimes, I will admit, sometimes I've been about as popular with students and parents as a grandpa teasing his 12-year-old son about whether or not he has a girlfriend. Sometimes it doesn't go well. So I had all that running through my mind. The tongue, the tongue, the tongue. What do we do with the tongue? And then I noticed that first line about teachers of the word. Oh, teachers of the word. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And I thought, oh, context. Context is king. We always must look at the context of a scripture verse when we address it and we teach it. While we can dwell on the way we speak to and about one another, it seems the context here is about true and false doctrine and the responsibility that teachers in the church have to teach true and co correct doctrine and not set the church of God on fire with false teaching. A, teaching, a teacher of the church can sometimes wreck somebody's faith with their false teachings in the way that they teach. This applies to the clergy as well as to university professors as well as to lay people who take up the responsibility of teaching in Sunday schools. The damage that wrong teaching, be it in substance and manner, may cause to souls is indicated by what James says about the tongue. What this text says about the judgment that teachers in the church will receive cannot be impressed too deeply on someone who teaches in the church today, be it professionally or as a volunteer. 
And since the pastor cannot teach all the classes, he must rely on the laity to help. But all teaching in the church is an extension of the pastoral office, and the pastor has doctrinal oversight, doctrinal oversight over all of it. And therefore, the ultimate burden rests upon him and upon his shoulders. Those who teach, as in pastors, we are bound by vows to teach not what we want to teach, but we are bound by our vows to teach what Christ wants to be taught and in the way that he wants it to be taught. Luther wrote about a preacher that he should be confident, he should be confident and sure of his doctrine, being able to say, my teaching stands and it is correct. It's a good teaching. This is evident from the fact that it builds on the Lord Christ. It lets God be our Lord, and it gives God the glory. So, if you run into a teacher of the church, now, well, sometimes people visit other congregations, so be it. Sometimes you go to college and you run into university professors. Uh, even, even our own Lutheran colleges, you might run into a university professor who is teaching a religion class. Um, you will run into um, people online or on TV proposing themselves to be teachers of the church, right? So when you're listening to these people, uh, you might be going to college and, and be in a certain class or visit a church in college. Let me say, if you run into a teacher of the church who denies either the inerrancy of the scripture or the divine inspiration of the Holy Bible, then you are to flee and to find your way back home to the place where you can be taught to trust the word of God and trust all of the word's promises. Because if someone teaches you something like this, that creation is just optional, that Adam and Eve weren't really, truly two individuals created by God, that the book of Genesis is just a collection of stories and so on and so forth, then if you are being taught that, then you can take all of this and just toss it. Because if Adam and Eve weren't real people, then death did not come into the world through their sin. And if death did not come into the world through their sin, which is what the scripture teaches and what our Lord Jesus Christ teaches, then Jesus himself is found to be a liar and all of this is for absolutely nothing. Then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. For if only in this life we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied more than all people. But what does the scripture tell us? Christ is raised from the dead. Christ is the first fruits of those who will rise from the dead and for first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We must cling and hold to what the scripture so tr clearly teaches. And many a heretic has burned a congregation of Christianity through false teachings of the word and false teachings of the sacraments. Too often has someone picked a church based on uh, the music they liked, the personality of the pastor, or that there were more kids in that church than the one that they used to go to, and not because of doctrine, not because of what is being taught in the walls of that church body. And what a distressing situation it is when someone goes where babies aren't baptized and where they do not believe in baptismal regeneration or it's taught that one's decision is more important than the command to baptize all nations, and that if a pastor or a church wants you to be re-baptized into their church and does not see the baptism placed upon you through the hand of God and his called and ordained servant as valid, then turn and walk away, for false doctrine is afoot. The same goes for the teaching of the sacrament of the altar. It is a deadly, busy, deadly serious business to come to an altar and say, I believe that Christ is here, that this is not simply a spiritual eating and drinking, but that Christ is here in my hand just as he has promised. For Christ has said of the body, this is my blood, and of the wine, or this is my body, and of the wine, this is my blood. And who am I then to put my reason and my senses above the divine majesty and declare that what Jesus must have meant was something other than what Jesus has said, simply because I see no flesh and blood sitting in my hands. Here, we can, in truth and willingly, sing after the sacrament of the altar, 
the nunc dimittis. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Who sang that? Who sang that song? Simeon sang that song. Simeon sang that song when he did what? When he took up the baby Jesus in his hands. For Simeon had been promised that he would not die until he sees the Lord's Christ. And when Simeon saw the baby Jesus and took the baby Jesus into his hand, holding Jesus in his hand, he said, in effect, Lord, I can die now. I can die in peace because I have seen the Christ, the Messiah that you have promised. And what is it that you are saying after you receive the sacrament of the altar? Precisely because we believe, teach, and confess the real presence of Christ in, with, and under the bread and wine of the sacrament of the altar, it is precisely because of that that you and I can sing, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace because we believe, teach, and confess that we have held Jesus in our hands. We have brought him to our lips. We have taken him into our own bodies. He for us and we for him. This is a deadly serious business and very important for false teaching can set the church ablaze. We approach Christ's supper repentant over our sin and earnestly seek to do better. And we are desiring more earnestly to believe that Christ died for our sins and to love God and love our neighbor. And here in the divine service, we must continue to rightly divide law and gospel and not seek to confuse the two of them. For what does the law do? The law tells us what we must do. What does the gospel speak of? The gospel speaks only of what God does. Ten times the law says, do this, It has nothing more to say of us, but do this. The gospel, on the other hand, demands nothing at all. Rather, it is a kind invitation to partake of the heavenly blessings, promising God's grace and salvation without any condition at all. So folks, we could go on and we could list the differences in doctrines or false teachings. These things could go on and on. Let's just simply close with this. Let's remember James' admonition that the teaching of false doctrine is a raging fire within the church and false doctrine can lead one straight to eternal fire. Therefore, let us not be found to be false witnesses about Christ. Let us continue to stick to the scriptures and to what teachers and to what Christ teaches us. And let us ever be mindful of the responsibilities that we take up when we teach the church. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now may that peace which passes all understanding be in your hearts and minds through the one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us now all rise for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we believe, help our unbelief. Sustain us through the many troubles and trials of this world. When unclean spirits afflict us and those that we love, revive our trust in you. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have given your beloved Son the tongue of one who is taught that he may know how to sustain with the word those who are weary. Prosper in every place the preaching of your gospel. Grant that all teachers of the word remain in true doctrine and do not set your churches ablaze with false teachings. By your spirit, enable your pastors to proclaim the word with clarity and joy, and by the same spirit, open the ears of your children to believe it with gladness and action. Lord, in your mercy. You, O God, created us male and female and have given the institution of marriage for the procreation of children and that husband and wife may delight in one another. Hear the thanksgivings of those who celebrate their wedding anniversaries this week. As Randy and Mary Simmer celebrate their 19th anniversary, we ask that you would be the constant companion in their home, leading they and their children in the paths of righteousness. 
We also thank you for the 43 years of marriage that you have given to Mike and Julie Middlestadt and for all the blessings given therein. For Mary and Randy and for Julie and Mike, grant them many more years together to celebrate their love for one another and their faith towards you. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Jesus, you have promised that all things are possible for the one who believes. In such faith we bring before you Reese Voley, as his body struggles with the liver transplant that he has received. We implore you to spare his life and grant him health and strength and a safe return home to grow up and to praise your name. We ask for your continued recovery for Kevin Ray, Dorothy Donath, and Henry Bartman, and all others in need, asking you to grant them health and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we know that your Son is near in his Holy Supper, giving in his body and his blood his saving righteousness for the forgiveness of sins. Grant repentance and faith to all who come to his table, that they may welcome him with joy, praying, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reception of our gifts and offerings. You have been sharing in Sunday morning worship at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street in Lincoln, Illinois where you just heard Rev. Mark Thompson deliver this morning's message. If you cannot be physically present, join us every Sunday morning on the radio at 8 a.m. over WLLM 1370 a.m. or WLLM 105.3 FM or at www.zlclinc.org where you will find links to the Internet stream and to Facebook Live. Zion is a member congregation of the Worldwide Fellowship of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you are without a church home, we invite you to become a part of our Zion family. If we may assist you in any way, please call us at 217-732-3946 or write to us at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street, Lincoln, Illinois, 62656. Zion also offers a premier education with a Christian worldview for children from age 3 through the 8th grade at Zion Lutheran School. For more information concerning our school, please contact our principal, Dr. Stephen Perry, at 217-732-3977. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We rise as we continue at the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. 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 The first communion hymn is I Come, O Savior, to Thy Table, hymn number 618, found in the Lutheran Service Book.
The third communion hymn is Lord of Glory, You Have Bought Us. Hymn number 851 found in the Lutheran Service Book.
the true body and true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith into life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and grant thee his peace. Amen. Amen. The closing hymn is number 921. On what has now been sown, hymn number 921, found in the Lutheran service book. Please be seated. Uh, please remember that, uh, let's see, next Sunday is the 22nd, right? Is that, okay, so next Sunday is Christian Ed Appreciation Sunday. So in between services, there will be a special coffee hour for uh, Sunday school teachers and those who have served as uh, in different offices in the Christian education of the congregation. And we'll be having that uh, presentations made in the auditorium in between services. So if that involves you or, well, that involves the whole congregation. So everybody, please be welcome to stay for Christian Ed Appreciation Sunday 
next Sunday. And may the Lord bless all of you. May he bless your comings in and your goings out from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.